All right, good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon um, as well, depending on where you are located. I'd like to welcome you um, to the AIM North America UDI webinar series. My name is Mary Lou Bosco, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for AIM North America. AIM North America is an, an alliance enabling the cooperation, development, and standardization of AIDC technologies. From barcodes to RFID to IoT, AIM North America is your advocate. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to go over with you. The presentation is being recorded. A recording will be made available in the coming days. All participants are muted and should stay muted throughout the course of the webinar. We also ask that you turn off your computer camera. If you have any questions, you can send those to AIM member services through the chat dialog option located at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Next, the AIM Antitrust and Collaboration Policy. It is our policy to conduct our operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. AIM North America activities shall create, excuse me, no AIM North America activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. Next is our Collaboration and Work Product Policy. This states that committee meetings and presentations are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of product intended solely for public domain. AIM North America has developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. Um, today, I'm here with subject matter experts from Alltech, GMBH, FOBA UDI laser marking, who will provide information on direct part marking using lasers in the medical, automotive, and the aerospace industries. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Faisal Benyad Sharif, business manager at FOBA Laser, and Christian Zonar, who is FOBA's global vertical manager for medical. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, this is uh, Faisal speaking with you uh, from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I've been with FOBA for about uh, a little more than 10 years. And I've been involved in the development and the management of the product um, that we are uh, going to present in some of the videos that you will see. But we will be mostly speaking about um, the data matrix uh, concept uh, used in different industries, the automotive, the medical, and the aerospace. Christian, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Faisal. So, good morning for me. As a medical, I brought you something typical of what is for medical, a laser mark. So, hello from Berlin, Germany. Uh, just to make a long story short, I'm with uh, FOBA for four years, but as I was sitting on your side uh, for 15 years, starting from little tiny dental implants, which are like this size, if you can see it in the screen. Uh, up to uh, radio surgery, surgical parts and, uh, of course, orthopedic and striker. So uh, what I help you and support you and our sales engineers, whatever you do, this is not about uh, laser uh, rocket science. It's really about keeping you compliant to make you capable to sell your products to the hospitals. Um, and this is why we aligned with a lot of associations like AIMIS uh, and uh, several difference, as you can see, medical amounts with MedTech. So whenever it comes down to regulation, um, we stay compliant and we support you. But now it's about you, Faisal. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you for the introduction. Meridu, thank you for introducing us. So uh, let's get started. So uh, as part of this presentation, it is, this is something new that we are going to try uh, with our audience. We want you to be uh, to participate uh, with us within this presentation. So there is an application uh, that I personally use, and uh, that's called uh, it's called Scandit. If you can download it on your phone, uh, or if you already have one, and you know, I want I'm asking you to download this one because this one has a feature that I want to show you. Uh, and we will use it during the presentation and we will share the information and you can have questions at the end of the presentation uh, as far as the results that we are seeing uh, when we look at 2D codes, all right? So the application is called Scandit. It's available for the iPhone as well as the Android um, operating system. 
So, two decodes. Uh, two decodes, there are uh, a variety of two decodes. There's more than one. We're all familiar with the uh, DNA matrix, which is used in the automotive, the aerospace, uh, the medical, or the semiconductor industry. Uh, this is what we call the DNA matrix. There's another common uh, 2D code that you, uh, everybody knows about. Uh, it's the QR code. This is what you find on um, magazines. You can find it in advertisements, uh, things like that. There's another uh, common uh, 2D codes that we tend to ignore that we're not really aware of it and not everybody considers it as a 2D code. It's really the PDF 417. This is a barcode that you find on your boarding pass or you can find on FedEx or UPS packages or uh, USPS. Uh, this is also, this includes um, information that's relevant to your package. Uh, if you have a reader like this one and you have a boarding pass, you will find out there is uh, some information that is not on your boarding pass that is included on your boarding pass if you can scan it, if you have a reader that can read it. Interesting, but uh, worth, uh, worth a try if you have a chance. So the structure of a 2D code is um, uh, not totally understood by everybody, but I want to share with you what a 2D code is, uh, how, it's, how it is constructed. So the first thing is you have a background. In this case, we have a white background, which is the, uh, the white uh, square that we have here. And then we have an L shape. Uh, the L shape is going to use to locate the 2D code uh, if you're trying to read one. So this is called the L alignment pattern. And you will notice that around the alignment pattern, there is uh, what we call a margin, which is a space that is clear. And if you mark a 2D code, if you intend to mark one, you have to make sure that you have this also called the quiet zone. Uh, you can't have anything in here. It needs to be really uh, a space that surrounds the 2D code that we will use to make sure that we locate a 2D code properly when uh, the instrument or the, the reader is trying to read it. The second thing is the clock pattern. Okay, the clock pattern is what is going to tell us where to look for the different cells. These squares are called cells, okay? And uh, so this is the clock pattern to read it um, vertically, and this is the clock pattern to read it horizontally, to read the, the cells horizontally, and so on. And then you have the data. So um, if you take your phone right now and you try to read uh, that data matrix that's there, you will find out that your phone is not going uh, to be able to read it. There's no data that comes up. But then if you take your content, and this is the data that's, uh, that we are including to decode, if we bring it inside, that uh, structure, then now if you try to read it to your cell phone, you should be able to read something. It should be done something, okay? So this is how a 2D code is constructed. Uh, 2D codes come in square patterns or they can come in a rectangular pattern. Rectangular patterns are very useful if you're dealing uh, with cylindrical service, surfaces. And I will show you uh, some examples down the presentation. And you can see you have different sizes from a 10 by 10. So a 10 by 10 would be a, a 10 cells across uh, by 10 cells down. Uh, you can see you can do 16 by 48 in rectangular, so it can be pretty large. And let's look at the content of a 2D code. So the content can be either numerical, it could be alphanumeric. Uh, alphanumeric would be uh, zero, uh, zero through nine, or A through Z, and the characters have to be uppercase. Okay, your content has to be, uh, if you stick with that phanumeric, just remember that the characters uh, are going to be uh, uppercase characters. Now, the third option is uh, you can include ASCII characters, uh, uh, ASCII characters, characters from the ASCII table. And for example, if you mark a zero, uh, an ASCII, the ASCII value of zero in uh, decimal is actually 48, in hex it's 30. I want to point out just a few of them. And these are, especially the ones that are in this column, these are non-printable characters. Uh, for example, if we look at the number four here, uh, it says EOT, that means end of transmission. So if you're sending data through, let's say, serial port, and uh, you want to say that I'm finished transmitting, you can send that character. And when you create 2D codes, you can even use that, uh, uh, these characters to actually, uh, as we will see it in the next uh, slides, when you can construct a structure that you can use for communication. 
So size matter in this case. So if you look at uh, uh, 2D code, so this is a 10 by 10. And you can see if we go with a 10 by 10, the number of characters, um, numerical characters that we can include, can put six. So you can say one, two, three, four, five, six. You can't add another character, another digit to uh, the content of this 2D code. If you go to ASCII data, then you can only put one. Uh, if you increase the size, you can see the number of characters, uh, alphanumeric characters or numerical characters jumps from 6 to 44, and ASCII characters jumps from 1 to 20. And then as you increase it, this is a 40 by 40, you can see now you can put a lot more data. But what you notice is the cell size becomes smaller as you increase uh, the size of your data matrix. And that could be a problem because uh, the smaller you make it, the, the more difficult it becomes to read. So you have to find a balance between what you intend to put into this 2D code and the cell size that you are going to use or the array, si uh, the array size that you are going to use when you put this 2D code. One of the main challenge or one of the main challenges that we see in the industry is the space needed to put a 2D code. Ideally, you want to put it as big as you, as big as you want, uh, but you realize and we realize in the industry that the space is always limited and I will show you some applications. Uh, this is a table that shows you that uh, the number of characters that you can include. So if you go to 144 by 144, you can put 1500 characters uh, as, as binary characters or ASCII data into it because so you can put quite a lot of information. So um, 2D codes get encoded uh, and you have different options. This is when I'm going to pull up your phone and try to use your um, data matrix reader or code reader if you have one and we will, um, we can discuss later the results that you have. So, this is a 2D code that has no encoding into it. That means it has, uh, it's, uh, it's, has ASCII information. So characters and uh, uh, digits that are built in. And if you read it, you should be able to read exactly what's in here. Same content. That's where you should be getting. This is another 2D code, but this one is encoded into what we call a UDI. It's an FDA requirement uh, for uh, medical device manufacturers to include a unique device identifier on uh, the medical devices. And Christian Zona will tell you more about it uh, later in the presentation. So if you use your cell phone now and you try to read it, if your cell phone is designed to use, uh, to read a UDI, uh, if you have scanned it, you should be getting the information that I get here. What the application has done, it has noticed that the content has some characters that are not uh, printable, that, are not, that cannot be displayed, but it's able to decipher the content and tell you that in the study code, um, there is what we call a global uh, trade item identification number that is uh, encoded into this thing. And this is the number, it goes one, two, three, et cetera. Uh, this is the, the top line here. Uh, it has a batch number, and this is regarding, uh, uh, let's say, a device that's been manufactured with a certain uh, lot or batch number, and this is the name, which you see here is the name of the lot number, and it's able to break it down into pieces. There's another format that's also, uh, and this one comes from the Department of Defense, called the IUID, or the Item Unique Identification, and this one has even more uh, of a structure into it um, that is defined by GS1. And uh, Christian will also tell you more about this one, is you can see how it's built into, it has a structure where it has a left square bracket, a right bracket, uh, and so on. And then it has an RS and a GS, and RS is a, re a record separator, and it has a group separator. And at the end, uh, you remember the number four that we were talking about? This is an end of transmission. That means um, that content uh, ends at this point. And this is a way of encoding um, 2D codes in a unique fashion uh, where you can transmit information that can be uh, sorted out into specific uh, details that are needed down the process. So just be aware that there are different encoding techniques um, uh, available that you can use. And it's, it's really defined by the industry uh, by the customer who's, who wants to meet a certain standard. 
Now, as far as standards, there are um, many ISO standards available in the industry. Uh, and uh, it can be very uh, overwhelming. <laughs> it can be frustrating deciding, oh, which standard am I gonna go with? Well, I'm gonna try to make it fairly simple and say, if you're marking to decodes, you're most likely to deal with two standards. Um, one is called the ISO 15415, and I'm very, going to explain what it is. And there is another one, which is the uh, ISO IECTR 29158 AIN DPM. So I will refer to it as AIN DPM, uh, DPM standing for direct part marking. And the other one I will refer to it as 15415. These are the two things that you at least need to know about it because it will make a difference depending on what you uh, are marking on. So this is important to know about. So let me explain what they are. So the 15415 is really intended for marking 2D codes on, let's say a label, piece of paper that is white or a piece of plastic that has a diffuse surface where you're giving a black mark on a white surface or vice versa, it could be also the opposite. But it really is intended for materials like paper light. So then you need to stick with that standard and that standard is available. You can go on the web, read about it. Um, the challenge is really is going to come to um, verifying uh, the same. We're going to talk about that in the next slide. The second thing is the one that we talked about is the AIM DPM. Okay, the AIM DPM is direct part marking means you are putting a 2D code directly on the part. You're not putting a label that you're sticking on the part, but you're actually putting that to the cut on the part. On the part. And you can see that the content here, this is a, a UDI that we put on a, on a medical device, and it's permanent, permanently marked on the device, so it's uh, supposed to last uh, the life of the product. So the marking technologies that you can use, uh, there's a variety of them among the most common one is um, you can do laser etching. Uh, you can do chemical etching, that's another uh, solution for marking these UV codes. Or you can use dot pin. Uh, dot, dot pin is probably one of the oldest techniques that's used. This is a, basically a nail that hits the material and um, writes characters and, and digits and so on, uh, on on the material. Now, I was talking a little bit earlier about verification. So when you mark a 2D code, it gets graded. Um, you know, it can be of a good quality or of a poor quality. And the quality is measured by a grade that goes from A to F. Uh, there's no E grade. The industry in general is focused on getting a grade that is between A and C, okay? Uh, anything, uh, when you read a 2D code with a verifier, which is a device, a device that actually uh, qualifies or, or quantifies the quality of the uh, of the, the marked 2D code, it's able to tell you if this 2D code is going to be readable by most standards, most uh, verifiers are in the market. So uh, AIM and ISO have put the standard together which is the, the one that we were talking about, the IIM DPM, that tells you if a, a 2D code that is marked is of a quality that is acceptable. And um, verifiers, uh, as you can see here, there's uh, just some examples. Uh, this one uh, meets the AIM DPM standard. This one does two, this one does two, but this one actually doesn't do the AIM DPM, but does the 15415. I'll show you an example where the difference comes up. So we took two pieces of uh, stainless steel that we marked with a laser and we played with the laser parameter. So one is marked in a certain fashion and the other one is marked in a different way. So let's look at this one first. And we put it into, under two readers. We put it first under the AIM DPM reader and it passed as a good grade, as an A. And we put it under the ISO 15415 and it also came up as an A. Perfect. Both standard pass, this is excellent. Now we went to the second one and we said, well, let's try it. Well, see what we've got out of this. So with AIM DPM standard, this one came up pretty well. Uh, it came up as an A and you can see it. But then when we use the wrong reader, it actually failed. Uh, you can see that same 2D code that looked actually perfect. Uh, when we put it under this reader, it was not able to read it. And you can take your phone right now and you can go to each one and you should be able to read 
each of these 2D codes. And if you try this one with your phone, you will see that you're not going to be able to read it. Okay, so it's important to pick, to pick the right reader when you're dealing with, uh, with data matrix marked on um, other than paper. Typically, that's what you want. Well, the reason why it works with one and it doesn't work with the other one is pretty simple. So again, the 15415 verifier, this is a reader that has basically a camera and has some lights around it. And what it does, it shines lights uh, from, uh, that generate from around the lens and it's able to uh, read the 2D code. If you take an AMDPM reader or verifier, you will find out, <coughs> excuse me, you will find out that it has multiple light source built in. And the way it works is uh, it shines first light for, uh, from um, you know, a coaxial light that basically allows it to have light that goes straight down through the optics of the, uh, of the camera. And it switches from one set of light to another one. And it goes back and forth until it gets a good readout of, let's say this one, first one fails, the second one might actually pass, and the third one may give you the best result. And that's how you are able to get a good reading uh, because you're using all these optional light sources that the system cycles through until it gives a good readout. And whichever light gives the good readout is gonna be the readout that's going to be reported. So it basically allows you to uh, use different light structures to get a readout out of the device, uh, out of the mark that may not be uh, readable with a 1515 verifier, okay? Uh, so improving, um, there's a few things you can do when you deal with the situation. There's definitely ways of improving the read readability of your 2D codes. Uh, so one of the first thing what you want to do is you want to make sure you want to try to mark on flat surfaces. Uh, if you can avoid uh, curved surfaces, it is best to stick to a flat surface. There's another thing you can do is you can avoid shiny surfaces. Uh, because the quality of the readout is going to be based on the contrast that you get between the background and the 2D code. There are techniques that you can use. Uh, what we did here is we prepared that surface. We put a square that gave us a white contrast, a white um, color surface, diffused white, and then we put a 2D code on it. And then uh, by going from this to this, we were able to increase the grade from a C to an A because now we had a nice background uh, that was kind of uh, whitish with a black mark on top of it. Uh, it, improved, it improved the readability of the 2D code. Uh, this is a technique you want to use sometimes on shiny surfaces, okay? Uh, that's, that's a very good one. Another uh, thing that you might want to avoid is deep engraving. Uh, deep engraving means is you're actually etching the material um, pretty deep. It becomes a lot more difficult when you have um, uh, deep holes that you're trying to create to create a 2D code. And these are some of the techniques that are required. Uh, some manufacturers require you to engrave and not to mark, do a surface mark. This is called a surface mark where you're just disturbing the surface to turn it black uh, instead of actually digging into the material. This is an example of uh, a video where we actually uh, marking uh, on, a, on a brake pad. So you will notice uh, in this case, what we have is uh, uh, a system that's called Mosaic that basically figures out the part orientation, the part position. So here the operator places the part. You notice that there's, there are no fixtures holding it. The first thing that we do is we look at the part and we say, is this the right part? And the first line in green tells me, yes, this is the right part. The laser goes and marks um, the serial number of the part and also uh, marks a 2D code. And what you see is uh, we marked here um, and it actually read the 2D code. I'll see, look at it right now here. Oops. Uh, and what you see is, um, just move on just a little bit toward the end here. Uh, this is where we actually read the 2D code and we got an A. So we were able to mark it. Uh, and uh, read it and grade it and provide feedback to the user that this code is, uh, meets the standard that he's uh, expecting out of, uh, um, of the mark that was put on the uh, brake pad. 
Another challenge, and this is a common question that comes um, uh, what we hear quite often uh, from customers, is how small can you can you market 3D code? A lot of um, uh, a lot of companies are trying to put a very small 3D code because the space is limited. We've seen people who want to put 3D code on screws on the, the, the head of the screw, and it's a real challenge. But uh, the good thing is, um, so the, the first thing is the space or the cell size that you are allowed to use when you create a 2D code. The smallest one is about 100 microns, which is about 4,000. Uh, this is the smallest one. And this is what you see here as a 2D code. Uh, this is actually a UDI code that we created. And you can see it's about 100 micron cell size, about a 90 micron cell size. It's about three millimeters in width. But we push the technology a little, uh, a little further to see how small, small we can make it. And you can see that this one is actually 1.3 millimeters. And uh, the cell size uh, is down to 40 microns. So a little less than 2,000. Uh, 2, you can see what we did here uh, to achieve this is instead of using a square uh, cell size, uh, we actually used a circle or a dot as uh, a cell, and, and if you have a good reader, you can actually read that 2D code, which is a, a, a UDI that we use in this situation. Now, I did was, I was talking earlier about marking on, on cylindrical surfaces. So uh, NASA has actually put together uh, a fairly nice presentation on marking uh, 2D codes on uh, cylindrical surfaces, and their conclusion was there, uh, if you're marking a 2D code on a, on a cylinder, uh, you want to stay within 5% of the circumference. So that represents about 18 degrees. So you want to be between plus or minus 9 degrees. If you're marking a 2D code, that guarantees you readability and um, allows you to uh, maintain a good contrast on the mark itself. Because as you notice, as you go away from the center, uh, you're approaching the surface at an angle and your contrast and your mark will, uh, will tend to fade as you go away from uh, the zero degree. There's one thing you should not do is um, use what we call segmentation. The segmentation process is where you mark a portion of the 2D code, you rotate the part, and then you mark the second part. Um, this is actually is not going to work for you because uh, when you are going to read it, it will look distorted and it will likely fail when you try to mark it, okay? Uh, so these are two things you need to be aware of. I will pass on uh, the baton to Christian, and uh, Christian, are you still with us? Sure, here I am. Excellent. And, uh, taking over, so thank you. I mean, you heard about uh, UDI before, and uh, Faisal mentioned it on the page 15. So my short part is just to show you uh, how to technically implement the UDI compliant to regulations. In the end of my short part, I will show you some um, samples, how we mark different parts in the medical industry. So you see here, it's a unique device identifier, unique device identification. Most common standard is used by, UD, by UDI is uh, the GS1 standard, where we are global solution partner. So we can see on the next slide, um, here uh, and how, how we manage it in our software. So everything in my experience, medically wise, is everything has to be validated. And to do a validated process that really can stand an audit um, makes life easier. So you see on the left-hand side, the content not in GSA format because you see the FOBA left up there. And on the right-hand side, you see you think you see like the same, but you see there's like a tilde, this little sign at the beginning and uh, one FOBA, so um, our software automatically recognizes uh, who is and which is the GS1 standard format. So um, it adds the characters and requires, of course, special readers like Margas in our case. But this can be transferred also to other industry. And the industries, it's not just uh, medical, so I think for others it's also valuable. So when we go to the next slide, um, you can see there how it really works. So you see on the upper right hand, the UDI. So UDI, just for remember, uh, device EI plus PI, device identifier plus production identifier, brings you to the unique device identification. So for example, you see this um, red circle up there. 
uh, it shows in bracket zero one. So this is like the G Tim. Um, three lines below, number 17, shows the expiry date, which is more detailed uh, on the next slide that you can see. Move on here. So as I said before, if you go all the way down below the screen of the software, of the marker software, you see the 17 again in the third line and, uh, and the queenly marked numbers. So 17 correspond corresponds as a date of expiration. Um, which is really uh, unique. And uh, what we do in the end is a uh, trace and track, uh, not only complying to a 21 CFR uh, from the FDA, also for the MDR 2017-745. Uh, so in the end, um, this makes you capable uh, to be really compliant in a safe, secure process you want set up. And not only just starting this and setting it up, uh, I guess the most valuable uh, support uh, we can supply you and everybody really should look for is to start it with an IQO view that the qualification runs more easy, more fluent, uh, that you can validate a process with a yearly maintenance qualification. So that's structure of the number, the UDI. So uh, you see the GTIN, the global trade item number all the way below with 14 digits. So if we go then to the next slide, um, you will see what is uh, really coming up. I mean, there were a lot of people uh, yelling and saying, you, uh, the MDR is postponed one year. Uh, well, official saying it's COVID-19, but uh, inofficial, it's more like there was not a real technical structure and not a database being finished. So in the end, uh, it's delayed, but it doesn't say it's a delay or postponing of the requirements of diver part marking. So the Deadlines for diaper marking, marking for all classes, all risk classes from the highest risk, three to one over two B and two A are still the same. So what I really want to put attention from you on is, and I don't know how is it about aerospace uh, and automotive, but really the first thing is technical cleanliness of the medical device must be proved. So why is it? So you have to do a corrosion resistant test. So this must be proven and documented by test. If you don't have a document, uh, it's no test and the other way around. So why is it you see the third point, laser contaminates the product. So how is it clean here? So it changes the surface. Uh, laser marking is not labeling because we had some um, medical conferences. We were put into a section about packaging. No, we are not packaging. Laser marking is really, uh, influencing and changing your medical device, your hip, your uh, forceps, whatever you have, your containers itself. So in the end, uh, the MDR, so medical device regulation, uh, is in the first big bullet, uh, is really binding for all manufacturers, also with, with regards to cleanliness. So the cycle doesn't start in the hospital after a, a surgical treatment in the theater, brought to the reprocessing department, cleaned or autoclaved. No, it's really starts in the moment where the finishing is done. And that's why you have to do a technical cleanliness. You can prove it mainly common by a passivation. So passivation as part of the final cleaning uh, is yeah, how to prove it and how to be compliant here. So uh, product traceability shows here cleanliness must be demonstrated and ensured ensure through the whole entire life cycle. So, um, and that means that the safety of product must be continuously verified. And I get very often the questions that, well, it's done, it's verified, I've got a validated process. Now we have to reprove it every three years. So, and the last point is really, what is not defined must be re recorded in written document documentation. And this is a point I will uh, show you at the end when I compare the FDA and the MDR from the uh, common content and from the differences. So really uh, technical documentation is a huge work, huge challenge, huge effort you have to deliver to be compliant with the MDR. So on the next slide, um, you will see then some hints uh, or further norms and standards. One is the ISO 19-2027. So uh, it's a standard for implants for surgery, which shows you the cleanliness of the PD implants and what are the general requirements. So you can say, well, I'm not an implant manufacturer. Yeah, but this norm is like a blueprint and it refers to other norms. So uh, please be aware of this norm. 
And very interesting is the next ISO, the 10993 um, So the biological evalu evaluation of medical devices. So really um, about bioburden, how does really uh, Leighton Martin change the product itself? What is the character doing? So in part 18, you see the chemical characterization of materials. So it's relevant because the laser heat input modifies the material. It doesn't matter which, there's no rocket science. So which laser type you're using, it's always a change. Even if it says it's cold, it's not, not total cold. There's always uh, a warm influence. Uh, and we go to the next slide. Uh, you will see here what I already announced. So what are really the similarities between the medical device regulation in Europe and the FDA? So really the UDI code as a first point, uh, requirements for structure and size are the same. You see it before, Basil started on page 15 with this. I repeated this with the example with GS1 for or this GS1 format. So second, the UDI data have to be transferred into one central database. I know the FDA GUDI did the database existing running, have to use it. The MDR has the European UDAMID, um, which is uh, legally uh, enforced or legally uh, yeah, uh, decided, but uh, those resources for uh, coding stuff and where to build it, where to have it, it's uh, I'm saying it's in progress, but I didn't see a real database until now. It doesn't say that you don't have to be prepared for this. And MDR and FDA require postmark surveillance. And this is what I see uh, when I talk to my network and uh, like an orthopedic business, they really suffer under this because it's really hard to find medical centers uh, and uh, healthcare practitioners which are prepared, which want to do uh, postmark surveillance for a lower uh, paying for each patient. Because if you prepare a product before you uh, get them, um, for 10K, of course, there's a lot more R&D budget, but if you do it during, it's already introduced into the market and Europe got its CE mark, uh, it's much more difficult to get for a low budget uh, the willingness of the doctors to participate and help you. So we come to the differences, the second large point. So the MDR, and this was interesting uh, in the final version, um, we had like three changes. The MDR demands UDI code in and that's a abbreviation, HRI, human readable. So one, two, three, four, five, ABC, six, and AIDC. So this is the uh, automated data capture, identification data capture. This is machine readable, like, the, uh, like a GTIN, like a data matrix uh, code. So this is really requested to have this in correspond correspondence. So if here, uh, the space is limited, at least you have to have machine readable, the AIDC on MDR, uh, we're complying to MDR. The FDA will accept, maybe because it's more uh, technical experience, human readable in characters, uh, numbers, and machine readable if space is limited. So the MDR sets much higher demands on technical documentation. I come to this later an example, but really, uh, what we found out mainly on class one R products, which are re reusable instruments, we call it like grandfather forceps, uh, never been any document written down. It was just a heritage from grandfather to his son and his grandson, given like the patent of it, this has to be written down uh, completely in a technical documentation. So in the end, last point, does fit for UDA, FDA UDA means fit for MDR UDA? Yes, you can say the UDI laser marking process is transferable from the FDA to the MDR. So we come to the next slide. Um, showing you, as promised, some application examples. You see in the left hand up there, and Faisal already explained it. You have this data matrix code with a quiet zone, so it's uh, better for the readability. It's all about the lightning, as uh, Faisal mentioned. You have a tibia plate in the middle, you have a clamp, and also want to show some plastics like an IBE container. And uh, yes, for sure, we can do in the US model or in Germany, not in Germany, uh, a remote session due to COVID 19. It's maybe not suitable to travel, but you can see your own uh, application being done. That's what we offer here. So that's about the application, which I really uh, appreciate that we could show you this. So on the next slide, 
we can show you and we will yeah, summarize about corrosion resistance. So in the end, we can make really, it's very clear. It's about, UDI is about durability and readability of the code. It's not about any super red, super green, whatever the color should be. Uh, interesting is first time I looked at a laser marking, I was sort of like, wow, this is good for my eye. I can see it uh, perfectly. But when I did it with a really um, uh, rarefied classifier and uh, it wasn't an A, it was a C. So it, it was also the other way around. So don't rely here on what you see, really rely what's the most readable with the verifier. So it's a corrosion resistance to be proof for the whole complete product. Um, the code readability has to be yeah, according to the ISO 2915, Basil showed it before. Uh, and yeah, for the lifetime of the whole product, we have here medical industry white paper, different white papers that you can access on our webpage. So next, and then, then I'm come closing to the end that you can, yeah, it's a reading type. So here, um, Faisal shown it before, but I really have to recommend you the mosaic. To start here, um, we have here uh, medical parts, uh, I guess were clamps or something similar. Um, they are just put into a marking field. You see the camera, this is really live, it's real. And uh, you put in just by accident, they're not uh, fixed with a picture. And what I really like here is uh, from uh, compliance, normally for every picture, you have to write down a technical documentation as part of the validated process. This will bring you a lot of work, a lot of weeks, months. So with this, you don't need it because it's in the software. So you see here, uh, it will be marked and it's really put in, you see the marking starts, it will be put in just by accident, not just in a row and marks pretty fast. So um, we change the position, we overlay the mark, the same, same content with the data matrix code and some more information. And in the end, uh, you will see, put it uh, in front of the lens and the camera, this is our associate in the lab, Jan, and you can see it's laser mark with a quiet zone, Cobra Mosaic. So this is a pretty easy way to do it and really helps you managing your technical documentation. Um, so, this is mostly it. Um, so uh, we have this all at one glance at the end. This is your process in the end. You start with the UDI, you create a code on the right hand side, like at two o'clock, at three o'clock. You have to integrate a camera, the vision system. We're running 17 years, which is one only system uh, calibrated with the laser. You don't have to validate two systems like a laser and a camera. And the way down, you see mosaic, six o'clock. Laser is marking, then you have get a pre mark inspection, of course, to uh, mark the right part. And now, where the error is, you have the post mark inspection to read back um, to validate the code. And then you can add it to the yeah, customer database and add it to the MDR database, the UDMED or the FDA database to the GUDI. Did. That's mainly all. Um, so, yeah, come up to question. I give the word back to Mary. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we appreciate your insights today. And if you're ready, we can um, begin with some questions um, from the audience. Now, if you're in the audience and you're interested in submitting a question, you can send those to a member services using the chat dialogue option located at the bottom right hand um, side of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, we do have about 10 minutes. So gentlemen, the first question is, what is the smallest practical X-DIM, D-I-M, you recommend? Um, this is Faisal. So um, as far as putting um, a 2D code, the smallest we would recommend is to stay. Uh, if you recall, we did have a slide that talked about the smallest size of a 2D code that you would put in. Uh, the recommendation is uh, to stay above the uh, a cell site that's larger than 0 0.1 millimeter. So maybe 50% larger than this. Uh, that would be the recommendation. Uh, larger is always better. Uh, larger means you can, um, most readers will be able to read it. So if you were to a 200 micron, 300 micron, um, that's, um, if you can afford to do that, given that you have the space, given that you have space available for it, then our recommendation is uh, 
to try that. Yep. Yeah, nothing to add. Yes. Um, there, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Christian, there did you have anything to add? Me. Okay. No, I mean, Very some people ask also about human readable. Uh, what is human read for a human readable uh, size or one millimeter is the minimum what we expect here. Uh, but yeah, just to, to add this, but so Basil answered yep. it completely. Thank you yeah. mm -hmm. for writing this, yes. Another question is um, someone wanted more clarity or information between, um, did you have speak on two verifiers or two verifier mm -hmm. processes? So more details on, on the different verifi verifiers. Is that a question? Marido? Yes, the difference between the verifiers. Yes, so uh, if you uh, recall when we looked at the verifiers, uh, so there's two types of verifiers that you can find in the market. Uh, there's the one that supports the ISO 15415. And remember, ISO 15415 is really intended for 2D codes that are marked on paper. And you have the, uh, the one that supports the AMDPM standard. So that's the other the type. And you can tell the difference. Uh, so if you look at the See if we can see some verifiers here uh, that I have in the picture. Uh, they are a lot more complex. So you can see that um, this is, um, these are a few brands that are available, or models are available in the industry. And uh, it really the complexity is the amount of the, the type of lightings uh, that are included in the reader. So in this case, you can see that it's a pretty simple reader. It has lights around the camera. This one is more complex because it's actually uh, cycling through different light sources that are part of the system. So the cost difference is, gonna, is going to be significant between uh, a 15415 and an AMDPM uh, verifier just because of the complexity of the software, the hardware, uh, and the device itself. All right, thank you. Another question is someone said several years ago they saw a white paper that indicated a smaller code was more resilient to cleaning than a larger code. Do you know if this is correct or available? I'm not aware of uh, a paper that actually um, that describes the resilience of, of a, 2D, a smaller 2D code versus a larger one. Now, unfortunately, I'm not aware of it, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Okay. Another question is unique part marking is usually the most expensive part of labeling. Um, do you offer automated medium? Yeah, I can answer this for sure. Yes, we do. Yeah, we have one, one side we have the special application request, uh, we do uh, like a customized automated system, but we also have integrators offering this also on base on our M series, which is the uh, most common machine in the medically wise industry. So for more details, please uh, come up to us and uh, we will take care of your application, find the right technical solution. Uh, and yeah, with the highest throughput, I guess, because that's, I guess, is the question why it's referring to an automated medium, yeah. Now, how are rectangular UDI codes made? Uh, the participants said that they have only been able to generate square codes. Oh, uh, it's really uh, based on the software that you use that generate the 2D code. Most um, software packages that would generate 2D code, including the one that we, we provide, uh, give, they give you a choice. And you can see this is actually a screenshot of the, the software itself. It gives you a choice of rectangular uh, the square 2D codes, and it gives you a choice of rectangular 2D codes. And these, these um, uh, sizes, are actually defined by AIM. Uh, so the AIM standard, uh, and this is what you can see here in this table. So the symbol size, these are the square ones that go from 10 by 10 to 144 by 144. And this is what, these are the options that you should have available in a rectangular format, eight by 18 to 16 by 48. So if you don't see it, it's just that your software does not support it, or it may be hidden uh, into the software itself. So it might want to contact the company that produces the software to uh, guide you into uh, generating a rectangular one. It's a standard, uh, it should be a standard process, a standard solution that's available to you. Okay. Next question is, is inline verification possible? 
Yes, uh, we do have, uh, let's probably try to define what is inline. Uh, I would define inline and, and maybe uh, the person who asked the question can correct me if they come along here, but inline I assume uh, in production line, is that what we mean? Is this uh, what the question is about? Uh, if it's an inline production based on uh, a, a device being marked and uh, inspected uh, during the production process, yes, it's totally possible. Uh, you totally. just yeah, I agree. have to remember yeah. Yeah. that when you do an inline uh, verification, the verification process takes time because you're cycling through the different light sources, and um, especially if you're not marking on paper. So there is, uh, it is possible. Uh, it's just that it increases your uh, cycle time uh, from mm -hmm. what if you have to do it for each one. And they did confirm that they met inline production lines. Okay, yeah, so it's totally possible. It is not something that you can do on a fly. Uh, at least I'm not aware of a solution that exists today. Again, for the main reason is uh, when you do a verification uh, on a part, if you recall uh, the, um, the slide where I had the lights, you can see uh, in this thing, this is what happens, is you can see that uh, we, we have different light sources and we switch from one light source to another to make sure that we have uh, uh, an acceptable uh, readout out of the, the mark that's on the part. The next question is, what is the average cost of an installation OFA laser marker for UDI? Ooh, that is, uh, that is a tough one to answer because it's, um, I hate to say it, but it really is, it's, it depends on the application. It depends on mm -hmm. the marking, how we're marking it. Um, yeah, you can start very simple with a desktop solution, yeah, um, up to really uh, customize the software, which more and more customers require, although they can cover a lot, uh, most with the marker software, but depends on if you uh, have just like a single workstation or you have more lines and more uh, laser marking stations, but this is really uh, just uh, to give a rough number, it's really difficult to say because even if you just and um, build in a rail system, just the laser itself. It's of course different than you have a whole workstation, but even the software matters. So this can, yeah, this has mm -hmm. to be really tested and give, to give a really good answer on application results. Right. Next question is, what do you mean with ASCII data, and it's um, RESP, binary data capacity? Okay, um, so let's look at uh, the slide. So um, as you recall what we had here, um, see if we have the, go to the right slide here, I think it's this one. So you can have numerical content, that's a zero through nine. Uh, you can have alphanumeric, which is zero through nine and the, uh, the alphabet, A through Z. ASCII characters is any character that's included. You can basically look at your keyboard and uh, any character that's on your keyboard is included in what they call the ASCII table. Okay, that's also called binary data. ASCII data is also called binary data. It's binary because it goes beyond the alphabet and, and the numbers and the characters that uh, include in your keyboard, particularly these characters that, that uh, these uh, non, these characters that you cannot display that are part of uh, this table. Uh, and the, the ASCII table is uh, a way of a way of, this, of um, printing or uh, communicating, uh, allowing communication between computers. It's a really the basic um, uh, table of characters that you can use uh, for communicating uh, between computers, typically that's what it is. And I hope that answers the question. What is your opinion about 2D barcoding versus standard barcode? Um, they um, are interested in your feedback for future growth in industry sectors. Uh, I assume standard barcode means a 1D code, uh, which is, uh, I, so. yeah. I assume that's what it's meant. Well, there's definitely a, a significant difference between the two. Uh, when you look at a barcode, and if we look just at um, the different 2D codes, when we looked at the beginning, actually, on the first slide, um, a standard code, I assume, is just a barcode, a linear, linear barcode that you have. 
the more in, you, you can pack a lot more information into a 2D code than you do in a, in a linear code or a 1D code, also called as a 1D code. The, the reason is 2D codes have, um, have a compression algorithm that's built in that allows you to, uh, as you remember um, the table, you can do, um, uh, let's look at the numbers here. You can go up to 1500 characters that you can put into uh, a 144 by 144 data matrix. So a lot of characters that you can put in. And uh, uh, again, because they have this uh, built-in algorithm that compresses the information, you can put a lot more. The other thing that's very important, I didn't talk about it, is 2D code are still readable even if they are damaged. If you have part of the 2D code that is damaged, your reader, uh, because of redundancy that is built into the 2D code, you're able, the system, uh, the reader will be able to reconstruct the content and tell you what it is. On a linear barcode, uh, you cannot do that. If two bars are missing or three bars are missing, it's difficult to reconstruct it. You don't have redundancy as far as information. So um, I definitely see it as, um, and we're seeing more and more growth over the, over the years more acceptance and more um, applications that require uh, data matrix on uh, devices or instruments or uh, in the automotive, in the airspace, uh, in almost all industries nowadays. Um, the next question is, are your lasers able to communicate with other label management software packages? So the software has, um, is able, has a way of communicating with the outside world um, we have uh, uh, TCP IP, we have Ethernet IP, we have uh, Profinet. All these ways of communicating are available. Uh, yes, so to answer the question, yes, you're, uh, we do have ways of communicating with the outside world and other readers. Right. And then the final question, um, is Mark US able to communicate with other systems for data management? For example, get a batch number from ERP to generate and mark 2D codes. Then ERP transmits data to GUDID um, and UAMED. Yes, absolutely. So we, we, uh, we actually do have a very interesting question because we do have what we call an advanced operator plugin that was developed particularly for the medical industry. And for that exact purpose, uh, that uh, is brought up um, uh, in the question, the subject that brought up in the question is that we provide um, uh, the ability to communicate uh, with uh, external databases, basically bringing in uh, what Christian Zona was talking about, uh, the, the G10 number, uh, the UDI, and, and sharing information. Actually, the system does even more than that because it's able to, as Christian was saying, it's able to do a validation of the part before it marks it. It's able to align the content to the part, and it's able to validate uh, or verify the content that is put in onto the uh, onto the, the device in this case, so you can validate the, the readability uh, of a 2D code that's put in onto a medical device to make sure that it meets standards. Yes. All right. Very good. Well, thank you, Faisal and Christian, thank for your time. Mary, oh, I'm Mary, sorry. Go ahead. I, I did see one more question. Uh, is your offering available in Australia, direct or via channel? Uh, first and the yes. Uh, we do have customers using in Australia, and we have a distributor, but uh, if there are more inquiries, uh, uh, the question can be uh, answered by Faisal or me, so uh, you see yes. our emails at the end of the presentation. So I interrupt you, but I just didn't want to miss this. Nope, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And again, um, we do thank Faisal and Christian for their time today and also for their very thoughtful insights. Okay. Um, thank you to the audience because um, you were very active in your participation and with the question and answer period. So um, I do thank you for that as well. Um, I'll be sending out a corresponding survey um, and I ask that the participants please take some time to complete it. So this will help us develop future AIM North America webinars. We will also notify you when the recording is ready for, um, from today's webinar, which will be posted on the AIM North America YouTube channel. Um, thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful day.